Today is February already, somehow, and um, like last month when we talked about sowing our seeds, this month, the theme of our month is taking care of your seeds. Can you guys say that together? Taking care of your seeds. Nice. Um, so I've been watching, I've been having a lot of free time lately, which is like so unusual for me. Um, yeah, some of y'all are like a little jealous. I see it in your face. It's okay. Just be patient. You'll get there. Um, but because I'm like, you know, not in school and I work pretty, like, not stagnant, a pretty set schedule. After work, you know, a lot of times I'll have to like help my mom to do things and it gives her more reason to like, She's like, oh, you're not doing homework anymore. Let's go here, 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 do this. But aside from that, I've actually, I've been having a lot of free time. And back when I was in school, I never had, like, a lot of time to watch shows. Are you guys a show watcher or a movie watcher? Show? Movie? I'm a movie watcher because I can't, like, I can't sit there and watch one episode of a show. Like, if I'm watching a show, I'll watch the whole thing. Like, I'll try to do it as fast as I can. I binge, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Um, whether it's a Korean drama, which those are the worst to, like, because that's why people, when they're like, oh, like, what are you watching nowadays? I'm like, nothing. Because then I, if not, I would never be finished watching it. Like, I would keep doing it, keep doing it. So, you know, I haven't learned my lesson very well. And I've been watching this show. It's called The Chosen. How many of you guys know the show? Or heard of it? Thanks, Celine. Um, all right, all right, guys. It's a show basically about, about Jesus, and I hope that doesn't, like, turn you off, but it's basically a show. T- most of it, I feel like, is about Jesus' ministry. Like, it does talk a little bit about his, um, his life or his birth, but it mostly talks about his life here on earth and his ministry. Um, and I've been watching that show, like, nonstop. I finished all three seasons already, and I started, like, two weeks ago maybe. And each episode is, like, an hour long. So you can imagine how many hours. I mean, sometimes I do it when I'm, like, doing other things. But it takes up a lot of time. But one thing I really love about the show, and I will say, if you do decide to watch the show, like, you can't take everything in the show at face value. Because, you know, it's basically, like, an interpretation of, like, Jesus' life on earth and the Bible. But not every detail is the same, like, in the Bible. Because they have to, like, you know, fill it in because it's, like, a show. It's for entertainment. But I really like it. I, I watched, like, the first episode. It's, like, not scary at all if you guys are worried about that. Like, I watched the first episode, and it starts off talking about demons. <laughs> so it's not scary. But that, like, at first, that turned me off. And I was like, oh, I'm, like, a little scared, so I just stopped watching it. But I got through that when I came back to it recently. Um, and one thing that I really like about um, watching the show is you get to see not only, like, Jesus talking, but a lot of the show focuses on the disciples And it kind of takes its own spin on, like, what they would be like, you know, like, gives more personality to them. Again, not everything is, like, directly from the Bible because it has to use, like, context. But I I believe that, like, overall, like, they're trying to imitate, like, what would have happened or, like, the scenes to cause suspense, et cetera. Um, Yeah, so without spoiling it, like, um, a big part, I feel like, of the show is, like, Jesus going to meet each one of his disciples and, like, him calling them. For example, like, Peter, when he met Peter on the boat, it, like, summarizes and wraps up a lot of, like, your Sunday school stories that, like, you probably don't remember. Like, I would have to literally look up in the Bible, like, after I was watching an episode, be like, wait, did that really happen? Or, like, what am I missing? Because I would forget a lot of things, right? Like, a lot of things that I learned or knew growing up, um, they just, I forgot. But it was so interesting to see, like, the interaction between Jesus and disciple, but also between disciple and disciple. Like, I've never thought about that before. Like, how a lot of the disciples in the show are like, yeah, like, Jesus is like, basically, he's like, follow me. Like, simple. Like, follow me. And they literally drop everything that they're doing. You know, for example, Peter was a fisherman, you know. All he did his life was fish to provide for his family, to pay, um, like, his wages and stuff. And, like, he had to leave all of that and go and follow Jesus and he was just one of like the 12 that did also the same thing you know imagine like if I told you right now today wherever you are in your life in your career in your aspirations in your dreams in your goals drop everything and just go follow this one man wherever he goes whatever he does preaching the gospel like it's scary and it's like confusing at times right 
uh, I really was intrigued by the interactions between the disciples. Like, Peter would be talking to, like, Andrew, right, his brother, and be like, where are we going? Like, where are we going next? What's Jesus going to do next? And for us, it's easy to read it in the Bible because it already happened. So everything we know, like, what's coming next, you just read the next page or read the next chapter. But imagine being there, like, in real life, not knowing what's coming next. Like, not knowing where Jesus is going to go next. And, like, hello, like, Jesus, I thought we were supposed to follow him, but, like, I'm confused. And Jesus would always tell them, like, my time is not yet. Like, you know, the time has not come yet. Like, whenever he would do miracles and the disciples would be like, Jesus, like, show everybody so they can see how, like, cool you are and believe in you. Some miracles Jesus would do in secret because he was like, my time is not yet. But that was hard for them to understand because they were like, what do you mean it takes time? Like, what do you mean, like, it's slow? Like, why don't we just speed this up so everyone can know about you, everyone can talk about you? And that would cause them to, like, quarrel. Quarrel? Like, argue. It would cause them to, like, you know how you have, like, disagreements with your friends about where to go eat after church? Or how, like, you never know, like, what's coming next. Or maybe you're a planner and your friend is not a planner. Like, those disagreements are, are normal and they happen. So let's get into the word of God. And, again, like, recapping January, we talked about sowing our seeds and what that looks like, right? How you need to sow your seeds individually and be faithful in sowing your seeds. And February is talking about taking care of those seeds. Can we pull up the verse? Thanks, Jer. In James chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, I, I took it in the message version um, because I just like the wording. So let's read this together. One, two, three. Meanwhile, oh, hold on, hold on, slide over. Let's read it all together. One, two, three. Meanwhile, friends, wait patiently for the master's arrival. You see, farmers do this all the time, waiting for their valuable crops to mature. Patiently letting the rain do its slow but sure work. Be patient like that. Stay steady and strong because the master could arrive any time. Amen. So similar, like, you guys need to use a lot of imagination when Jesus is talking about, like, or when James is writing and the author is writing about waiting patiently like a farmer, right? Similarly, like, the disciples in the show, like, they, were, they needed to wait patiently for the master to do what he needed to do in between the time of, like, introducing himself to the people and, like, where we're going to go next. Like, one miracle after another. Like, what tomorrow was going to look like wasn't the same as today. For me, I would have struggled because I thrive on routine. Like, I need to know what I'm doing today, what I'm doing tomorrow, write a list in my planner that I usually don't follow through with, but at least I wrote it, you know, like, in my planner. But this wasn't the case. And you're probably, okay, like, you're probably like, okay, like, what does this have to do with, you know, planting seeds have to do with knowing what's coming next. My point that I want to make here and that um, is the title of my sermon is that taking care of your seed, it takes time. Here. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean call you out like that. It takes time. Everyone say, it takes time. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, it takes time. All right. It takes time. Thank you. Things are not going to happen, like, A to B instantly like you want them to, to be. And that's, like, always me too. Let's open up to the verse. Why does, like, but why, right? Why does God call us to be patient and take, uh, in sowing our seeds? The first one, the first point that I want to make, why God calls you to be patient is because the process of the harvest is ugly and slow. Let that sink in for a second. The process of harvest is ugly and slow. I'm not going to tell you to tell your neighbor because I feel like that won't go well. Not the neighbor, okay? The process, all right? All right, bring it back. Let's go back to that verse, okay? The process is ugly and slow. It's saying, wait patiently for the master's arrival. The, the farmer does this all the time, waiting for the crops to mature. Patiently letting the rain do its slow but sure work. And I was, I actually spoke about this this morning at um, BKC, and I was, I had to use a lot of, like, visuals, right, for them, because I wanted to make sure they understand, but I think it even helps me understand. Like, we talked about, like, a little seed. Like, if you have one tiny seed, they're waiting to mature, they're waiting to grow on something. Like, the process of maturity for a seed when farmers grow crops, some can take between three to five months. 
some, depending on, like, the seasons. I did a little research. I'm not a plant mom or whatever, but, like, I know a thing or two, right? And it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of endurance and patience and consistency to get the right kind of crop. If you don't take care of that crop, like, on the board, I was drawing, like, the little seed. And I was like, all right, what happens next for the seed to grow? It doesn't just sprout right away. What has to happen first? It has to grow before it grows upwards, it has to grow downwards. It has to grow roots. So it has to be, like, deeply planted before you can even see any product or any result. And that process of growing roots is not pretty. It's not like, oh, yeah, I'm going to just grow a root today, and I'm going to just grow a root tomorrow. In order to grow a root, you have to, like, stretch. You have to be stretched. You have to be, like, processed, you know. I'm not saying that processed foods are, like, a good thing, but to get from one thing to another, like, even that idea, it takes a long process, just like a farmer. The one thing that I, like, struggle with a lot is I feel like, especially lately, like, um, as I've been, like, reflecting and journaling every now and then, like, I realize that, like, man, I am always rushing. Do you guys ever feel like that? Like, I'm always rushing to get from point A to point B or, like, if I got to go to church in the morning, I don't wake up early enough like today so that I'm rushing to get ready. And then I'm rushing to get to church. And then when I get to church, I'm like, I feel like I have so many things to do, which is like a great thing, right? But then over time, even outside of church, I always feel like I'm rushing. But God never rushes anything. Like our God is not a God who is like trying to speed things up or like, he needs you to be on some schedule. And maybe he does, but, like, your schedule is probably not even God's schedule. The timing and the amount of work that it takes for you to grow those roots, the process is going to be slow. Like, I was telling the students this morning, like, for you, it might be two months. For you, it might be five months. For you, it might be one year. The process of whatever it is you're trying to, to see the harvest of, right, whether it's what school you're going to go to, whether it's how do I resolve this friendship, whether it's how do I um, restore, like, my family and the issues, right? The process is sometimes going to take a lifetime. And that, we should find content in that, knowing that we have a God who isn't in a rush. You know, does that make sense? I hear a lot of, like, mm, and, like, nods. I like it. Okay. But, yeah, so, like, our God is not... God is who's going to rush. Like, the process is going to be ugly. There's going to be tears, battle wounds, battle scars, like, along the way, right? Hard conversations you need to have, whoever they may be. But if you put in that work, that's the only way you're going to get to that harvest. Like, you can't expect to just jump over. Like, in the illustration this morning, I, w- I should have just drew it. I should have just brought the board up. But it's okay. In the illustration this morning, like, we were talking about how when I was in school, like, um, I don't know if you guys ever did this in, like, science class when you are like, a kid. You had, like, a little cup, and they put, like, dirt in it, and your teacher's, like, giving you one seed each. And then you're all assigned to, like, that little seed or that little plant. You watch it grow. And, like, we would put it on the windowsill. Like, I remember this in science class. And the first thing I would do when I come to class that day, I would run to go check on it to see. And the next day, I would run to go check on it to see if anything had sprouted. And then there's, like, this little bud that sprouts, and you're, like, so excited because you're, like, oh, my God, I did that. But my point is, is that these things take time. The process is going to be slow, and it's usually not going to be pretty. So if you're expecting to, like, plant your seed, go from step A to step B, and then harvest right away, that's really not how it usually works, you know. You guys with me? All right. And the, <laughs> the second reason why um, God is telling us and, like, James is talking about waiting is because there's always a test. Before there is a testimony. Let's say that together. There's always a test before there's a testimony. Yeah, I I thought I would I thought I slayed that. So there's like this there's like this pattern, right, that we see in the Bible. You have a person or a character. Literally, I think I feel like if you name any character, David, Jonah, like all the Sunday school characters you think about, who you're like, oh David, he was a king. He was like, let's take him for example. Like, yeah, he was a king, but he didn't just From the time that Samuel the prophet anointed David with the oil and said, oh, you're going to be a king. He didn't just jump the next day, next morning and walked into the palace like, hey, like Samuel told me I'm going to be a king. So like now it's my time. No. David had to go through a lot of tests, a lot of trials 
But actually, I want to talk about someone else who also had to endure a lot of trials before he got to his promise, before he got to his testimony. His name is Joseph. I want to say Joseph. Yeah, Joseph. <laughs> yeah, Joseph. Not this Joseph, but you too. But also the Joseph in the Bible. So let's pull it up. All right. I need to give a lot of context. You know, all of you guys are like, Joseph. Like you probably know also in the Bible who he is. But if you don't know, that's totally okay. Um, I encourage you guys to go back and read. Like if you didn't read um, your Bible today or if you need something, you're like, because sometimes this is me too. Like if you need something to read, like Genesis has so many good stories that you, you go back to every time and you keep learning something new. You know what I mean? And especially this story about Joseph. I learned it when I was like in Sunday school. I learned it when I taught Sunday school. And then I'm learning it over and over again every time I pick it up. So, all right, the context. I'm going to shorten it and condense it. So stay with me here. Because I was like, do I just explain it or do I make you all read like three chapters? So you're welcome. So basically, Joseph, um, he was like favored by his father, right? His brothers got like, this is going to go quick. Favored by his father's brothers got jealous. Brothers sold said Joseph into slavery in Egypt. So now, right? Like, it's one thing if you don't like your sibling or something, but like to sell them into, ooh, that would, my parents, ooh. But like, keep with me here. So he's in, he's in slavery, right? Now he's in Egypt. And he's working. He was misunderstood. He was just doing his good old thing. He was like working, working hard, like cleaning the palace. All of a sudden, Pharaoh's wife comes over and trying to tempt him, like, hey, Pookie, you know, like, trying to call him and trying to, like, about have him sleep with her. And Joseph was like, oh, no. Like, he's like, stay away from me. Like, not today. And what did she do? If you guys know the story, she told, like, her husband, she basically, like, told a lie that ended up getting Joseph in prison. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> Not this, Joseph. So, you know, you can imagine, like, if this was a movie or something, like, or this was, I, okay, it is a movie, thanks. But it's, like, tragic, right? This, he was just, you know, a little kid who maybe was a little too prideful, told all his brothers, like, oh, you're going to bow down to me one day, and told all his brothers, like, oh, I'm the favorite, but then got sold into slavery. And then when he was sold to slavery, he got, like, tempted, and, like, this woman lied about him, was, and he ended up in prison, you know. Those are all the tests that Joseph had to go through, but let's read this verse together. Um, yes, this is when Joseph is in prison. I'll read it for you guys, actually. I got you. All right, Genesis 39, verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. Everyone say steadfast. Steadfast, steadfast love. And they gave him favor, say favor, favor, in the sight of the keepers of the prison. So what does that mean, right? Joseph wasn't just in the prison. Like, he didn't just be like, all right, well, I'm here now. Like, that's all I got. And he just stayed there. No. But even when he was in the middle of the test, even when he was in the middle of, like, probably his lowest point, like, he did not know when he was going to get out of prison. He had no idea if he was ever going to fulfill that promise or what was going to happen to him. But even in the middle of that season, when he was at his lowest, he didn't just, like, let it go to waste, you know. He relied on God and he looked to God, but God didn't leave him either, you know. God never left him. In fact, God showed him steadfast love, a steady love, a constant love, you know. And God shows the same kind of love to us. Like, even when you guys are going through the motions in your week and you don't feel like, you don't feel God's steady love, isn't that so, like, horrible to rely how you, like, whether or not God loves you on, like, your emotions, you know, how you're feeling this morning. Oh, you woke up today a little bit late and you're rushing, so now your whole day is going bad and you don't feel God's steady love, you know. But Joseph, he had that steadfast love that God gave him and he gave him favor as well on the side of in the sight of the prison keeper. What that means is when he was in prison, he not only was he, like, basically just waiting, but he didn't just make that time go by, like, you know. You know what I mean? Like, he was the basically the keeper of the prison. Like, um, the keeper of the prison, like, 
trusted him with all the things that were going on. It's like if a teacher kind of like has, I'm trying to think of how to explain this. It's like if, if someone gives you a role, like, oh, you take care of these people. Like if I say, James, you're in charge of all of these people. And I say, Fena, you're in charge of all of these people. It's kind of like that. So like the prison keeper gave Joseph the authority and power. So he, was, he wasn't just in prison like wallowing away, right? He was making use out of it. And God was working through him. But what happened, right, there were these two people who also ended up in the prison with him. These were the cupbearer and the baker. And this is, like, all very condensed. So I, I really, Appa, I encourage you guys to go back and read this again, you know, carefully. And the baker and the cupbearer had these dreams, right? They had these dreams that they couldn't interpret. But because God was with Joseph and he gave him that favor, and he honored him and he loved him, he was able to interpret those dreams. But then, even then, what happened? The cupbearer was the one who went back to his position, right? If you guys remember the story. He ended up in jail. But then three days later, he got out of jail. He was like, oh, I'm going to remember you. It's like if your friend is like, oh, I'm going to remember you. Like, don't worry. And you're expecting and waiting on a phone call. Or like, you, let's say you hang out with your friend. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'll text you later. Like, we'll hang out and like plan a text. Oh, my gosh, I'm so guilty of that all the time. But then you don't like follow through, right? That's what happened with this cupbearer. So not only was Joseph, again, to recap, not only was he sold into slavery, he was tempted and he was wrongfully accused and thrown in prison. And then when he got to prison and he had like the slightest bit of hope that someone was going to remember him, did they? No. They forgot about him again. So it was like this test, test after test after test that Joseph faced and it was like when was it ever going to end, you know. But the last reason why God makes us so patient when we are going through our trials and planting our seeds, the last one, is that so God can be glorified in everything instead of us. Yes, it's like God receives all the glory. Everyone say, God receives all the glory. Because imagine if like life was so smooth for Joseph, or let's say he was sold into slavery and somehow escaped. Like, he would have been like, wow, look at me. I'm so cool. And I, like, did that. You know, or I'm him. Or whatever the case is. Or maybe he was tempted and then he, he like, won favor with Pharaoh early before he had to go through the trial in the prison. He would have been like, oh, that was easy. I can just do it again. Like, there would be no need for God in this situation. But once the cupbearer, so to continue the story, right, so you have, uh, you have Joseph finally in prison and that cupbearer, like, forgot about him. Basically, like, he got out of prison, went back to his normal life, and left him. No one, like, you can't rely. He couldn't rely on anybody besides God himself. Because even that man who was with him in the prison left him and forgot about him. But then, one day, Pharaoh himself had a dream that, like, he couldn't interpret. And that's when, it was like a light bulb, and that cupbearer remembered. He was like, oh, you're so right. I remember there was this guy named Joseph who could interpret those dreams. He was like, he can help you. So what did they do? They go and they send for Joseph. They're like, Joseph, come here. Like, and Joseph had to go through a process of getting cleansed, changing his clothes. He had to shave and all this stuff to, to present himself properly to Pharaoh. And when he did, Pharaoh's dream was basically like, he had um, a dream when Joseph interpreted it. It was like, oh, there will be seven years of famine. Well, seven years of plenty first. You know, a lot of crops, a lot of harvest. Like, there will be extra overflowing amount and then there will be seven years of famine and like if you're the king and if you're like the pharaoh in position of that like you would be shook to your core like what am I supposed to do with that information how am I supposed to navigate this right he didn't know what to do but because Joseph had that favor from God had that wisdom from God he interpreted that dream to him and then what did pharaoh say this I want us to read all together 37 through verses 37 through 40 ready one two three this proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all these, there is no, you shall be over my house. All my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. Dang. Imagine. Like, bruh, Pharaoh wasn't even a believer. 
Can you imagine someone who isn't a believer and seeing, like in verse 30, 38, Pharaoh said, can we find a man like this in whom the spirit of God lives in him? Like, no, you can't. Even, even Pharaoh didn't believe, but he saw through Joseph's life how much he relied on God. That ultimately, God was the one who ended up getting the glory of this situation. It wasn't because of Joseph's strength. It wasn't because he knew how to interpret dreams. It wasn't because of anything. It was because, because of God. And God ultimately got the glory. And if you know the end of the story, Joseph became like basically second in command. You, you could call him like the king of the place that he ruled over. And God loved him and cherished him. But he couldn't have gotten there. He couldn't have gotten to that testimony to share that victory story with others if he didn't first go through all those tests and trials over again and again and again.